In July 2011, the body of 32-year-old Rebecca Zahau was found hanging from a balcony at a Coronado mansion where she lived with her boyfriend, millionaire pharmaceuticals tycoon Jonah Shacknai. Her boyfriend's brother, Adam Shacknai, reported finding her body, which had been gagged with a t-shirt and bound at the hands and feet. A strange message was scrawled in black paint on the bedroom door. She saved him. Can he save her? Zahau's death came just days after her boyfriend's six-year-old son, Max, suffered a traumatic fall at the mansion, one that was ultimately fatal. His death was ruled an accident, hers a suicide. But many, including Zahau's family, don't believe that she took her own life. They believe she was murdered. And although no criminal charges have been filed in the case, the Zahau family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Adam Shacknai. A civil trial is now underway in San Diego Superior Court, and we are following it. For the San Diego Union Tribune, I'm Lauren Flynn. This is Under the Gavel. Before we get into week two of the trial, I'd like to make a quick correction. Previously, the UT, and therefore myself, reported that the message painted on the door of the guest bedroom where Rebecca was found hanging read, quote, she saved him, can he save her? We learned this week when the door was brought into court that the reporting was incorrect. It actually read, quote, she saved him, can you save her? I apologize for the inaccuracy. This week, one of the UT's public safety reporters, Terry Figueroa, reported in court on Monday. Court reporter Pauline Rappert, who is with me now, doesn't work Mondays, so she was in court Tuesday through Thursday. What can you tell us about Monday? What do you know about Monday? The door with a cryptic, almost riddle-like message painted on it was introduced into evidence on Monday. Um, the, the message that everyone has wondered about, what in the world it must mean and, and who wrote it, uh, said, she saved him, can you save her? And it was painted in black paint with a brush in all capital letters on two separate lines, but no punctuation on them. It was painted on a white door leading to a guest bedroom. And that bedroom, Re Rebecca Zahau used as a little art studio for painting pictures. And it's also the room from which she was found hanging on the balcony. Right. Now what, did, what, was what was the significance of bringing the door into court? Well, that message is the only writing found at the scene, and the sheriff's department and county medical examiner's office, which had ruled Mrs. Zahau's death to be a suicide, took that to be her final writing. The family that is suing Adam Shacknai for wrongful death, alleging that he killed Mrs. Zahau, believe that he wrote it and that the handwriting is closer to his style of handwriting than it is to hers. Um, the plaintiff's attorney, uh, Keith Greer, brought in a handwriting expert who looked at some of the lettering and compared that lettering on the door to signatures by both people on legal documents, both Mrs. Zahau and Adam Shacknai. Um, it was pointed out in court that um, Adam's signed signature is actually, he prints it and he uses all capital letters when he does so. Um, Rebecca Zahau did not. Her capital letters were only with the R and the Z and the others were written in a cursive style that's, that's typical. That, that seems, to me, if you're going to do a full investigation, to me that seems a little weird to only compare the writing to signatures, why not find another another piece of writing, something casual, something that they, because, you know, maybe they always write in cursive, maybe they don't. Maybe the only handwriting cursive that they use is in their signatures, or Rebecca's at least, so why not use both? Why not compare all of their handwriting? I don't know why additional samples weren't brought in for the handwriting ex expert to review. Um, I, I don't know if they weren't readily available, if they weren't made available. Um, 
I don't know if her family had handwritten letters in this day of texting and emails. Right. I'm, I'm not sure how much extensive writing they had available to them from either of them. Um, At least nothing you can necessarily confirm is theirs except on a legal document, which would be confirmed. Right. It would have taken an entire extra hearing to prove mm-hmm. the validity of those writings right. um, on there. And then the age of those documents might have come into play if people changed their writing over time or mm-hmm. or um, trying to prove that that they weren't in any way um, like temporarily disabled at the time they right. made those other writings. Right. Did the, did the handwriting expert determine that the handwriting was Adam Shacknize specifically? Was that his, what was his expert opinion? His final opinion went only this far, that the writing looked more like Adam Shacknize writing than it looked like Rebecca Zahau's. But under questioning, he agreed that he could not state that Adam Shacknai wrote that message on the door. Um, he, he was only given two people's handwriting to compare to the door. And of those two, he found one was more likely than the other. But he didn't compare the writing samples to, or the message on the door to, the handwriting of everyone Right, he, possibly in the area at that time. Because, right, he didn't. He didn't get handwriting signatures given to him by other members of their families, right. for instance, or anybody that had anything to do with that mansion. And certainly, um, if we were to imagine some still unknown person, then obviously he didn't have any samples of them. Now, the door that, that the message was on was brought into court right. on Monday. Right. And if you, we, I'm looking at a picture of it right now, and it, it is covered in black smudges in addition to the, to the writing. What is, what is that? Right. Originally, the door was bright white, and there are evidence photos showing the black paint on a clean white door. All of the black smudges was uh, fingerprint dust being put on there by the... Um, CSI team, the crime lab folks. And in court, we were told that there um, really weren't any fingerprints lifted off that door. Right. And near, near the, we talked in the last episode about how near the doorknob, specifically there were... Right. No the, prints on that either. And the fingerprint dust didn't stick to that part because it had recently been wiped. Right. Right. That was the theory that if there's no prints on it, it must have been wiped. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that covers Monday. What happened on Tuesday? The handwriting expert was still on the stand on Tuesday, um, cross-examination, and um, the um, lawyers for Adam Shacknai took him through why he did and did not compare other letters that were in common with Adam Shacknai's signature and the message in the door. Uh, The expert said he only focused on the letter A and the letter M because he could arrive at his conclusion through those two letters the best. Mm. But there were letters H and E and I that were not looked at extensively. That they all could have been used. That they could have been. And he um, just said they they really weren't similar enough to anything for him to to focus on. Hmm. You could also say like writing in acrylic paint on a door that is, you know, Mm -hmm. that's not something you're used to writing. So I would imagine that your handwriting is not going to be the same on a door as it is on a piece of paper. Right. It's not going to be the same with a paintbrush and acrylic paint Mm -hmm. as it is with a ballpoint pen. Right. He, he just barely acknowledged that to be true. Mm -hmm. And, and he said that frankly, this was the very first case he'd ever been, asked to analyze paintbrush writing. So he didn't have any background on determining mm-hmm. how similar or different writing on a door with, a, with paint would be to writing on paper on a tabletop with a pen or mm-hmm. pencil. Um, he, he didn't have that background to, to readily say why and how those would be different. Mm-hmm. Interesting. On Wednesday... 
They brought in a not expert. What is his title? He is uh, Lindsay Philpot, and he is a 30-year uh, charter boat captain, now retired, and he worked out of Long Beach um, at the time. Um, he is also, he called himself a forensic not analyst and hmm. said he has testified in other murder cases about how knots were used in those cases um, and, and was an important fat piece of evidence in these other cases. Um, so the plaintiffs brought him in to determine how likely Rebecca Zahau could have formed the knots that were found on her wrists and ankles, uh, apparently from the same rope uh, cut into two different lengths. What did he demonstrate in court? Well, I know we have a, we have the picture I'm looking at here. Looks like a very realistic. Um, it, I know it's a mannequin or a replica of a human body, and it, but it looks very realistic. The nails are painted, and it's under a white sheet. Before we talk about what the mariner did, why why would why would the 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 mannequin have to be so lifelike? And why did they paint the toenails? That really, to be honest, that that's creepy to me. It's um, upsetting. I would think to probably her family. Mm -hmm. But why would they um, need that? Right. Nobody said in court why those details were mm -hmm. added. So I can't really uh, explain that. Um, I I think whatever the material that the mannequin was made from it did seem to have a surface, sort of a skin that seemed very realistic, and you can get a sense of musculature under the skin, and it was very bendable and poseable. So I, I imagine that they just simply wanted to best replicate a real person okay. um, that could naturally bend in places that a real person would uh, with, with fingers and toes and ankles and knees and so on. Okay, so now let's get to the... So what what did this this mariner this not expert forensic not analyst what did he do? Mm -hmm. um, well, he had um, f autopsy photos of the actual knots around Rebecca Zahau's limbs, and images of those were projected on a large screen, and there were also paper copies, um, like eight by ten color photos too. And he was asked to approach the mannequin and use lengths of rope that were provided to him and to replicate the knots as far as he understood them from these photos. Um, when the sheriff's department collected those ropes, the ones around her ankles were so tight that they had to cut the ropes to remove them. And they marked where their cuts were so that that would be obvious forensically. The loops and knots around her wrists were able to be loosened enough that they could be just slipped off. And as part of the preservation, they were slipped onto some cardboard uh, paper tubes to uh, replicate wrists and, and arms. So he saw those photos of her actual body with the ropes, and then these paper tubes with the ropes. And he also saw the sheriff's department uh, demonstration that was put on a videotape of a woman, woman sitting in a chair with a rope and making these very same loops and knots around her own wrists and how a person could, in fact, do that. Uh, that was one large factor that the sheriff's and the County Medical Examiner's Office used in determining that if their person can do it, then Rebecca could have done it, and therefore it was another piece of evidence for them to decide it was a suicide. Right, because that's that in this case is one of the biggest things, the one of the biggest question marks of like if you're going to kill yourself, why, why bind your hand, why tie yourself up first of all, and then why tie your hands behind your back, mm -hmm. and is that possible? So then yes, that demonstration I saw that video is. Right. It makes it seem pretty easy. Right. The woman made all the loops and knots and then slipped her own left hand back out of the knots, put both hands behind her back, put her left hand back into the loops, and then was able to cinch it down tight. Mm -hmm. 
um, the theory you know, among um, psychologists is that if you do this, you cannot change your mind. Right. Um, that's that would be the major reason for binding yourself is to avoid changing your mind. Um, the gag would be to avoid calling for help. Mm. So Lindsay Philpot used the ropes and um, at instructions from the lawyer, he made the loops and he explained to jurors as he went that now he's putting this loop around and running it around in a figure eight and looping it and, and then cinching it down. After he was done, he was cross-examined by Adam Shackney's attorney who noticed that the final knots on the ankle bindings were facing the opposite way on her feet from what the autopsy photos showed. And I think it surprised him. I, I think he didn't realize he had done that because he looked again at the photos and looked again at his handiwork and said, yes, I did it wrong. And was this the first time he was seeing those photos and the first time he had a chance to do this? I don't know. I, I, I would think that he would have had a dry run before. I would think so too. But I don't actually know that. Um, it seems like, just from my personal point of view, it seems like it's kind of sloppy on the on the point of the mm-hmm. plaintiffs. Um, on the side of the plaintiffs, it's a little sloppy to bring in a not expert who does it backwards sort of disproving their point that like had another person tied her up, the ropes might have naturally been done the way that he did it. Well, I think he just started off in the wrong direction. I I think if he had put his beginning movement in the opposite place and followed his pattern from there, I think the knots would have ended up Hmm. in the same place as the original ones. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if he just got confused how... You know, when you look at a mirror and try to, to do something and then you realize you've got to do it backwards mm-hmm. from what you see in the mirror. And it might have been something like that looking at the I video. Okay. And, and, but I don't know yeah. that for sure. Um, the defense also pointed out that the type of rope that was being used for this demonstration was the same type that was used b- um, on or by Rebecca Zahau, but it was not the same kind of rope that the sheriff's demonstrator used. Mm. It was noted that that rope was of a different substance and it was a lot more flexible. And you can see in the video of her that she's flipping the rope around herself pretty quickly and easily, whereas the actual rope is a little stiffer type of, uh, of plastic that just doesn't bend quite as readily. Right. Because this, this um, rope is believed to be like boating, something to tow right, a boat. Right, right, or, or like um, for water skiing mm-hmm. that you might hold onto from the rope or and towing a lightweight thing across the water. Yeah, and that wouldn't necessarily need to be made. It wouldn't you flexibility wouldn't, wouldn't right. be a, a primary right. factor in choosing that rope. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, he also, the expert also said something rather startling under questioning. Um, he said that he believed that originally the rope binding her ankles and hands had been a single piece um, showing that she would have been hogtied, which means connected ankles and, and wrists, and that that single piece of rope then, after that was achieved, then was cut to create two separate mm. pieces. Um, that, I think, was a new thing. Did he say why he thought that? Well, when he drew the two ends of the rope together, there was enough uh, of the ends of the knots left to meet Mm. somewhere over her back. And so he thought that that's how that it was before a knife was used to sever the rope at that place. Interesting. Um, And she wouldn't... I, I would imagine no, it's pretty she, impossible to right, it, hogtie yourself. Right, I think it is. But we've so. all oh, everyone, everyone who's questioning this, everyone who has their their uh, doubts about her suicide, has said it's impossible to tie your hand, own hands behind your back, and that was disproven. Right. So maybe somebody out there knows how to hogtie themselves. Um, maybe, but that certainly hasn't been said. I mean, the other um, the thing that has been said by the defense is that. 
they started out as two separate ropes, that she mm. went and got a sharp knife from the kitchen and cut the lengths of rope herself that she wanted. Um, so, so the idea of being hogtied would clearly be a, an idea for uh, the allegation of being murdered and right. tied up by someone else. Right. That all that that theory, though, if she had been hogtied, kind of, I would imagine, disproves the her, the idea that she jumped off the balcony. But there were foot her footprints were found on the balcony. Well, her, her footprints were found on the balcony. So, it was a dirty balcony. Mm-hmm. She had bare feet, and they found her two heel prints side by side and then um, close to the railing, her toe prints um, indicating that she was standing on her toes or if for the murder theory being held up high enough that only her toes hit the ground, hit the balcony floor. So I don't see, yeah, to me that says that you she couldn't have been hogtied at least at the time she went over the balcony. Right. I mean, if that, those footprints, because we know that. Right. But she wouldn't have had to been. I mean, she wasn't found hogtied. Adam never right. said no, of that course. she was. And right. So that would have been cut before she was mm-hmm. thrown over, if that's what had happened. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know oh, I if, if the sheriff's department analyzed the two ends to see if they had been connected, but that still would fit a theory that she cut them first. Mm-hmm. Um, n- nobody has said that. They were separated by anything other than a sharp knife, and a sharp knife was found there. Right, but it's inter- it's interesting that it had that if the, the hogtied theory is correct, we may never know. I don't think we, we will, will ever know. Never know. Yeah, I don't think um, we can. To me, that's interesting because that if if she just if it was just cut, like it, it's interesting to me that if she hadn't been hogtied. Why is the amount of rope on her hands and her feet and the excess just enough to meet? Mm-hmm. That's interesting right. to me. Obviously, we'll never, we'll, we'll probably never know. Right. Um, now, and, and again, since he was doing this himself, um, I don't know if the way the knots came out just happened to be the right length to meet or, right. or not. So the reason this fits together, this mariner would be chosen to demonstrate these knots is because Adam Shack and I was a tugboat captain. So plaintiff's theory then is that he's a mariner of sorts. Right. He, he would know, know how, how to do knots. knots. Right. right. What kind of knots were used? Lindsay Philpott described one as an overhand knot, which is extremely common. It's how we start to tie our shoelaces mm-hmm. uh, before making the loops. And, um, So I think the defense was able to pretty quickly knock down that that is any kind of a nautical only knot. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly they would use it on boats, but it's used many other places. And in fact, um, Dan Webb, the defense attorney, asked Phil Putt on the stand, isn't it true that even gorillas and birds have been known to make overhand knots. And, wow. And he said, yes, uh, children can do it. Gorillas and birds can do it. People everywhere can do it. What's really striking to me is the fact that a bird can tie a knot. Right. I don't know out of what, but... <laughs> <laughs> Twigs, <laughs> yeah. string, yeah. Um, shoelaces. So the, and, and the second knot, well, well um, it was called a clove hitch. Hmm. And apparently... A clove hitch is made up of two half-hitch knots. Uh, and um, he said these also are used by other names as well, but that's how he understands them. And he said they definitely have nautical uses of lashing two separate ropes together, that you might do that so that they would hmm. be strongly held together. And he acknowledged that there could be non-boating uses for these also, maybe in camping or mm. or, or other uses. Um, he said they're pretty common also, obviously less common than the overhand, but um, he said they are certainly not exclusive, rare, or, or especially difficult to make. So Thursday, we had Dina Shackney, the ex-wife of Jonah Shackney, and the mother of Max Shackney, the boy who 
who fell, who and, fell then and died and later. Died. Right. What was what did she say in her deposition? Keith Kerr asked her you know, about her own background a little, and of course, then how um, how she met Jonah Shacknai and when and when they married and when she had Max. He asked her about whether she had ever met Jonah's brother Adam, and she said that yes, she had. That he was living in Tennessee, but in a number of occasions he would fly in for family events. She said for Passover and Hanukkah he would come in or other family celebrations. Um, Mr. Greer asked her a lot about how the brothers interacted and how Adam interacted with the family, and she had only positive things to say. She said that that the brothers would tease each other a lot. Um, she likened them to 13-year-old boys, that, that kind of behavior. Mm-hmm. Um and she said that Adam Shacknai was always respectful to the family members, that he got along well with others, um, that family meant a lot to him, uh, that he took the time to make sure he was there and part of it, um, and that the, the kids liked him. They liked their Uncle Adam. Um, Max, in particular, she said, did. So he sounds like just an all-American family man. Yeah, that's that's how she came across with him. Um, Mr. Greer asked her also then when she first met Rebecca, and how that went. And she um, she was divorced from Jonah by then. Dina was, and she knew Rebecca had become his girlfriend. And she finally told Jonah one day that she would like to meet Rebecca because Rebecca was having more of an influence over their child Max and and Jonah's older children from a prior marriage, and Dina was interested to know what Rebecca was like and how she was having a hand in raising the children. Uh, so they did meet, apparently, at a, at a coffee place, and um, she sounded impressed with Rebecca. She said she was attractive, well-built. She was impressed that Rebecca ran triathlons and that Rebecca brought family photos to show Dina and Dina said in the deposition that she was impressed with that to think that Re- Rebecca, too, uh, had a lot of family feeling in regard and um, talked about her upbringing in, in Burma and Germany before coming to the United States. So, uh, again, Dina didn't have anything bad to say about her. The only concerns were that she was learning that Rebecca had very strict ideas of a healthy diet that apparently the Shacknai family hadn't been so strict on. And she said one day Max's school phoned her, Dina, and said Max is crying because he's saying that all the school food is not healthy to eat. No. And he was hungry. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, so she went and took care of that. And she, I, it, she sounded like a little concerned that whether Rebecca was... A little the, intense. Yeah, a little I mean, it, little there could be worse, worse problems than, you know, right. your kids eating healthy. But Right. And, and Dina wasn't, didn't sound angry or anything. Mm-hmm. She was just, you know, she was concerned if her son wasn't eating anything. Um, so, yeah, that was about the, the worst thing she, she said about it. How does this fit into the story the plaintiffs are telling up to this point? I think it just helped lay groundwork of the relationships among all the people involved. So what else did Dina talk about? Um, Well, they moved into the night that her son took his fatal fall at the Coronado mansion that her ex-husband owned. And uh, he and Rebecca and the kids were spending part of the summer there. So uh, on this day in July, her husband sent her a notice that there was something very wrong and she needed to get to Rady Children's Hospital. And somewhere along the line that that a police officer or detective was going to drive her there and she should Mm. wait for that person. And she said she felt like she was waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering, why don't I just drive there myself and find out what's going on? So the policeman did take her there and... um, her husband, ex-husband, told her that the doctors believed Max had suffered a heart attack and fallen from the second floor uh, landing that had a banister that he would have fallen over. Dina said that she learned that Rebecca had started CPR in the boy and made sure that 
her little sister who was present uh, called 911 quickly. So Dina said that within you know, a very few minutes of his fall, he was getting CPR and she understood that if you have that process started within four minutes of a heart attack, you've got an excellent chance of survival. And so the doctors were viewing Max's injury through that light that um, that he would probably survive mm-hmm. because of that. Now, they immediately put him in a medically induced coma in order to control his breathing and um, just make sure he, he didn't fight any of the processes going on. Mm-hmm. One really heartbreaking statement that she made was that she didn't realize how serious the injuries were and she thought he was going to be out of the hospital in the following week. And she said she asked her ex-husband, in light of that, how will we work out our usual custody pattern of Max being with me some days and with you some days? And she said that her that Jonah got a little irritated at the topic and then said, well, you ought to thank Rebecca on your knees for saving him. And that she replied, I am grateful to her uh, that she started the CPR. And this all falls into the defense theory and the, the suicide theory that everyone thought Rebecca had saved Max at that point, uh, that her actions were had kept him alive. And if that is reflected on the message painted on the bedroom door, she saved him. Does that refer to Rebecca saving Max? The boy's condition did get worse by the like late into the second day. One one doctor told them that he didn't think the boy would ever walk or talk again. And Dina said Jonah was very angry over that and wanted the doctor fired for for waltzing in and, and saying such a thing. That, that neither of them believed it. And then other doctors came in and said, "No, they don't believe that's the case." Um, so Dina said, I, I absolutely believed he would be fine. And so this was the night before Rebecca's body was found, correct? Yes. And I read somewhere that, that Jonah called Rebecca to right. update her on Max's condition that R- night. Right. That's what he has said, that he told her the, the, the bad prognosis. Right. Left her a voicemail, right? Right. That Left was her never voicemail. recovered. Right. The, the sheriff's evidence was that the that, that message got deleted. Uh, they believed that she had listened to it and deleted it. Jonah's recollection is the only evidence of mm-hmm. what he did say to her. And again, the sheriff's suicide theory is based on him having given Rebecca very bad news about Max and that that would cause her to feel such guilt over the fact that she was the adult in charge when mm-hmm. Max took this fall, that that would prompt her to take her own life. Obviously, Jonah Shackney is not a suspect. Right. But if he was so angry that he wanted the doctor to be fired, who's to say he wouldn't rush home real quick? Well, he didn't. Confront his girlfriend. He didn't. They know he, he, didn't. he okay. was at the hospital because they saw the security video. I figured. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. Yeah. On Thursday, there was also a second deposition. Rebecca's sis- younger sister, Zena, who was 13 at the time, and she was the sister who was at the house when Max fell. Right. What did she right. say? She was asked to talk about what she was doing at the mansion, that um, she had flown in from Missouri, and Rebecca picked her up, and that Rebecca and Jonah and she and Max all went out to dinner. She said they, they got pizza they didn't like, so they came home and were getting into some snacks, and eventually everybody went to bed. They were planning to go to the beach the next day. They, um, when they got up, Rebecca made pancakes, and Jonah went off to the gym. Zena said she decided to take a shower because she hadn't done so after the flight from the day before, and when she got out of the shower, Rebecca was screaming for her to come downstairs. Um, Zena said she got dressed really quickly and ran downstairs and saw Rebecca kneeling on the floor and Max was lying unconscious in her lap 
with his head in her lap, and the chandelier was broken nearby, and his scooter was nearby, and the dog was running around, and uh, uh, Rebecca was yelling for her to get a phone and call 911. Zena said she didn't know where Rebecca's phone was and ran around looking for it, finally found it. The 911 call got made, and she was pretty much in a panic over what was going sure. on. And you're 13 years old. like Right. It's probably the first time she called 911. Right. Her sister, who's the adult in charge, who's... Screaming and crying. Screaming hysterically, like... Right. And Obviously, and it's understandable point, she would be panicked. Trying to resuscitate the boy. So the, the police got there and the paramedics got there and Max was taken to the hospital. That's about as far as they got with Zena. Obviously, you know, their whole day changed forever that day. Right. And... Zena had expected to stay for a couple of weeks, mm. and um, instead, Jonah decided, uh, maybe, um, and Rebecca, that it would be best if she went back home. So sh- she flew back home again that night. Mm. Court is back in session on Monday? Right. Right? Right. And, uh, who, and who do we expect to hear from next week? Um, Keith Greer has said he's going to call a rather renowned forensic pathologist named Mm. Cyril Wecht, who has testified in many big cases. He's known for having had a contrary opinion about the JFK assassination after he reviewed the Warren Commission reports and so on, that he did not agree that there was a single shooter. He's testified in a number of major trials across the country. I don't know if they'll finish questioning him on Monday, but um, Mr. Gurr has indicated he plans to call Adam Shacknai to the stand on Tuesday. Mm. So that will be a major day in court right. for that. Um, that'll be kind of the, a, a key moment in the trial. Right. That's who we're all waiting to hear from. Right. He's the only one, other one there. The um, plaintiff's case is still going on. I'm not really sure whether it'll be another week or another two weeks. And then, then the defense will get their turn, and they will call their witnesses. So, Pauline, do you have anything else to say? Um, no, I think we covered it. Great. Then I will. Uh, we'll talk again next week. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Each week, under the gavel, we'll dive into the details of the trial. We'll also have stories on our website, San Diego Union Tribune dot com. Each day, court is in session. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date. And if you can, please rate and review this podcast. It would really help us out and let us know what we can do better. If you have any questions, comments, information, notes, anything, please feel free to email me at lauren.flynn at sduniontribune.com. This week's Under the Gavel team includes myself, Lauren Flynn, as executive producer and editor. Reporting by Terry Figueroa and Pauline Rappard. Special thanks to the UT's public safety editor, Dana Littlefield, for her continued help and direction. Our artwork is by Gloria Orbagozo and Christina Bivik, and John McCutcheon is our editorial director. For the San Diego Union Tribune, I'm Lauren Flynn. Thank you for listening. <laughs>